recording. So welcome everyone to lecture number eight. Um, lecture number eight will be about primer design and will involve me talking a lot about how to design primers and the different types of primers that you can design. Um, I haven't updated it from last year. You can see that it's still 12-12-2019. Uh, um, that also gives you a bit of an idea that we are a little bit behind um, in the lectures. So. We have to figure that out. Um, I also got back um, uh, the response from the Prüfungsbüro and our exam date has been approved. So the exam date that we picked um, is good. Um, so we can use that um, and there will be another one. Um, but I will put the exam date and stuff on Moodle as well. Okay, so let's start. So I split up the overview for today in two different sections. So the first section will be polymerase chain reaction because that's what you use primers for, at least primarily. Um, so we will be talking about what is a good primer, when is a primer a primer. Yeah, we weren't ready with the previous topic. I know, I know, I know. And we will get back to that after we finish this lecture because I think that this lecture should be relatively short. Um, and then afterwards, uh, we will do the correlated trait locus mapping. Um, I think in the go live notification, it also says that we will do first the primers. And after that, we will do the uh, correlated trait locus mapping. Um, so I haven't added it to this presentation. So uh, at the end of this, I have to start swapping, which should be OK. Um, but yeah, um, very good. So. Um, Good, so polymer strain reaction and the thing that I like the most is the advanced primer section because that always gives some good exam questions in the end. Um, because I really like GASMERS and I also uh, like multiplex PCR. Um, so those are like more or less advanced PCR topics. Um, and then we will talk a little bit, I think, about databases and I, I, I dropped something um, from this. Uh, let me see. Yeah, I think I dropped a couple of slides there, but uh, we will kind of go through how to design primers. Um, and I already see that I made a spelling error on this uh, on this slide, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. All right, so let's start off with polymerase chain reaction. No, we're not going to start off because we're going to start off with the assignments from last week. And fortunately, someone was smart enough to mail me um, that the input data was not on Moodle. So I put the input data on Moodle for the assignments like two days ago um, after I got a mail. Um, but I was a little bit disappointed that no one actually did the assignments earlier. Um, so we'll have to see. I'm, I don't like making assignments obligatory, but be aware that the assignments are part of the lecture material. Um, so there can be questions about the assignments or um, doing things very similar to the assignments. So I would advise everyone to definitely um, do the assignments yourself. Um, of course, when you're stuck at something, you can always mail me. All right, so first off, answers to previous assignments. So um, let me switch to the um, uh, assignments. So the assignments were about phenotypes and QTL mapping. Um, so in the end, what I wanted you to do is, is program a very basic QTL mapping using a for loop. Um, but um, there's going to be some additional steps or some steps before we can do that. Um, so first is data QC. So let me switch to uh, my Notepad++ window that's here. So this is a list actually of all of the different emotes, um, but that's not what we want. Um, but I'm going to change my emote just because I can. Um, and then we are going to close this. Um, so answers to the assignment. So the first assignment was to load in the two files that were on Moodle. Um, so it was um, loading in the genotypes and the phenotypes file. Um, so I'm going to open up my R window and I'm just going to copy paste this to load in the two, um, the two files. So if you open up the files in a text editor, you would see that they are separated by tab and that there is a header in the file. So the header in the file um, uh, means that the first line of the file doesn't contain any data, but it just contains like the column headers. Um, good. So let me switch to R for you guys. And I'm just going to copy paste it in. Um, and this shows that indeed this is the old data directory. 
so that's bad so I have to update that um, so it's D D drive and I think this should work no so let me see where I actually put the um, where I put actually the input files because I moved them around after I uploaded them so <coughs> um, they should be in documents um, then we have uh, docx bioinformatics data and then we should go here all right so when we go back to the notepad plus plus window then hey, I'm just copy pasting it from where I am and then I am just going to say instead of backslashes we need to use forward slashes that's just because paths in Windows are not correctly formatted you could use a double backslash like I did before uh, but then this should be loading in our data so let's go to the R window and then we can indeed see that when I fix the path um, we can see that it's going the right way so we're loading in the genotypes and the phenotypes and the thing that I normally do right so when I load in some data in R um, I generally tend to look at the data so R has this head function um, to look at the top of the file and then you see that the genotypes file looks like this so you see that there are different individuals um, and then you have different markers and these are markers which are at a certain position in the genome but we won't be dealing with where they are located or anything like that um, yeah, so we have individuals in the rows and we have the markers in the columns um, if I look at the phenotypes file um, then you can see that this is the phenotypes file that I think we already used before but hey, again we have individuals in the rows and then we have the different phenotype measurements in the columns so um, that's the structure and hey, that's important to know because um, if um, hey, because when we want to match these two files together in the end uh, we need to know where the genotypes are located and where the phenotypes are located all right good so the first step was is to do some data QC because we we don't want to do um, and we don't want to have uh, too many missing data for example at certain marker positions um, so what I'm doing here is I'm defining a new variable called missing data um, since I haven't looked at any of the markers yet um, I'm putting this to null um, so it's just defining a new variable which contains nothing um, and then I just go through each of the columns of the genotype right because we just figured out that uh, um, the, the markers are in the columns so we go from one to the number of columns that are in the genotypes and then the thing which I'm going to do is I'm going to here take this this column out of the genotypes matrix right I am going to ask if they are NA so missing and I'm just gonna sum those up right because is an a will give me a um, true false factor so it will be zero if it is not an a and it will be one if it is an a so the number of missing values is just the sum of the the true false um, and then I'm going to divide that by the length of the number of genotypes that we have and then multiply it by a hundred um, because then we have a percentage of missing data um, for each of the markers um, after that I do a plot and uh, here I just plot this vector so here is one of these things which you see a lot in R is that if you do a for loop and then you define a variable first and then you just concatenate to this variable which initially is empty the value for the first marker and then you store it back in the same variable all right so let's plot and let's do the missing data computation so I'm just going to copy this and then we're going to go to the R window let me show you guys the R window as well and then here you see the plot that we made so the plot doesn't look that good but it's good enough to do some by eye looking at what is going to uh, what is happening so we see that there are around 120 markers because we have 120 values uh, we see that for most of the markers there is no missing data so zero percent missing data and the worst marker in the data set has around like slightly above three percent missing data um, yeah, so you can see that it goes into these lines so you see the, the horizontal lines in the data and that is of course here there are no individuals missing here there's one individual missing two individuals missing three individuals missing and this is probably like five or six individuals which have not been properly genotyped at these points but um, normally if you do quality control you would throw out any marker which is more than 5% missing data um, because those are generally markers that did not work 
well enough during the during the genotyping phase. All right, so that's the first quality control measurement that we do. We remove markers with more than 5% missing data. In this case, we don't have any markers with more than 5% missing data, so we don't have to remove anything. All right, and then we do the, do the same thing. Um, why am I having the same code here? Oh, I pressed the duplicate button. So this is just the same thing again. Um, no, no, no. Here we're going to go into the other direction. So here we're going to see, uh, because instead of going through the columns, um, we now go through the rows. So now we're going to ask how many, or how many data points are missing per individual. So we're just going to do the exact same thing. But now instead of going column by column, we're now just going to go row by row. Um, so let me show you that as well. And then, of course, we make a plot and we have to have a header which kind of describes what we're looking at. Um, so let me show you guys the R window. We're going to just throw it back in and then it looks like this. So here we see that there are two individuals which have some data quality issues, right? Because here we can see that most of the individuals are fully genotyped, um, but there are two individuals which have a relatively high amount of missing data. And this might be an issue, right? And this might be um, an issue that happened when we send in the DNA um, for genotyping. Um, it could be that the DNA was of poor quality, um, but that these individuals generally you won't want to remove from the data. Um, but I don't think actually that um, the assignment said that you should remove them because my code also doesn't remove them. Um, but normally, again, 5% missing data for an individual is acceptable, um, but anything above 5%, you would want to remove this individual from the data set. Um, but we're just going to continue because the assignment didn't ask you to remove it, I think. It just asked you to, to compare it. All right, and then the next step, we wanted to do some basic effect mapping. Um, so if you look at the genotypes, right? So let's go to the genotypes and let's just plot a little piece of this. So um, let's go and show the first 10 rows, first 10 columns. Then it looks like this. Um, so you see that there's a missing value here. But what you, what you see when you look at the matrix is that, that there are two genotype classes. You're either a one or you're a two. So the one means that the genotype came from the mother and the two means that the genotype came from the father. Um, yeah, so this individual one at the first marker has the marker inherited from the mother um, and individual three has the marker inherited from the father. Um, and, and because this is a recombinant inbred line, um, there's no heterozygous group. So yeah, because these individuals are stabilized. Um, so it is relatively easy to do an effect scan because hey, we only have two groups. So using these two groups, we can calculate the mean of these individuals for each of the two groups. And if we uh, discover a QTL, um, then that means that there probably is a big difference um, at, at the, between the one mean and the other mean. Um, so when we go back to Notepad++, um, then we can, I can show you how I did that. So the way that I did this is I defined two variables up front. So I have means one, which is the mean of the individuals carrying the genotype one. And I have means two, in which I'm going to store the mean of the individuals carrying the genotype two. So then I'm going to go through each of the markers, right, which are in the columns. So I'm saying four acts in one to the number of columns of genotypes. Well, what do I need to do? Well, I need to select the individuals, which are one. So I can use genotype X. So the genotypes in column X, which ones are one? Um, and I do the same thing for two. And I just store this into new variables that I define. And these variables can be overwritten um, because every marker has different individuals being one. and at another marker, another set of individuals will carry one. All right, then we have means one and means two. So we just use the mean function. And because there was some missing data, we saw that there was missing data. We have to add this na.remove equals true when we calculate the mean. Otherwise, if there is a single missing value, the mean will be na. Um, and to prevent that, had to kind of remove the missing data when you calculate the mean, you can add the parameter na equals true. Um, so what we're going to do then is calculate the mean of the individuals which had the genotype one. Um, and then we are going to um, take the mean of the individuals which have, um, in, uh, which have the genotype two. And I'm just going to do the first phenotype. So I'm just going to say comma one. And this means take the first phenotype from the phenotype data set. Um, so that one is called um, 
hydroxypropyl. So X3 hydroxypropyl. That's the phenotype that we're mapping. Yeah, of course, we could easily go through all of the gene uh, for through all of the phenotypes as well by just adding another for loop um, where we say four um, X in one to the number of columns of the phenotypes. But we're not going to do that. We're just going to do a single scan, single phenotype. Um, so then uh, what we are going to do is then in the end is we, we, we again do the same thing. So we calculate the mean, we add it to the means, um, so to this variable we defined, and then we're just going to store it back in. So if we then run this into R, so in the end, uh, of course, we want to make a plot. So we can plot the means 1 minus the means 2, and I want to plot this as a line. Um, and that's just what I'm saying here. So let me show you what happens when we do that. So let's go back to the R window. Um, so when we do this, um, it looks kind of like this, right? So we can see here that um, at kind of the first marker, more or less, um, the difference between mean one and mean two um, is minus 2000. That means that mean two was higher than mean one. Um, and we see something interesting because we see two peaks here um, where the difference is relatively big. Um, which is like plus um, plus 5,000, plus 6,000, or perhaps even more, plus 5,500. Yeah, but we see that, that there are two regions in the genome where there's a massive difference between individuals carrying a one genotype and individuals carrying a genotype two. And yeah, so they have inherited different pieces of DNA, and probably these pieces of DNA are um, determining or are controlling um, the difference in this phenotype that we're looking at. So this X3 um, propyl. So this is just a basic effect scan. Of course, we could have plotted this a little bit different as well, right? Because we could have say um, plot um, means one uh, minus means two. Um, well, what we would say is then plot means one, right? So we can only look, we can look at the, the the, the mean of the first group and we could of course just look at the mean of the second group um, and then you see that indeed there's something weird going on because had hey, these individuals here at the second peak in the, the second group um, their average is almost um, zero right normally the average is around like 5,000 um, but here these individuals only have like a thousand units of this of this phenotype um, we can we can plot them both so we can plot means one and then we can add means two to it um, by using the points function um, and then of course we want to give it a color um, for example red um, and then you see here that indeed that every time that the one group is low the other group is high and we see the same thing here um, yeah, but we can we can kind of look at the data but yeah, from this um, we learn yeah, by just plotting the mean one minus the mean two we learn that there are probably two regions in the genome where um, there is a gene which is controlling our phenotype expression so that's good so we learned something right we, we learned that um, when we do a scan like this um, that there are probably two um, two genes involved in the regulation of this phenotype all right, so then the next step is, of course, is because we're now only looking at differences in the mean, um, but are these differences significant, right? We want to know if there's a significant difference between the one group compared to the other group. Um, so let me switch back to Notepad. And we can do that more or less very similar in the same way. But now, instead of defining the two means, we define a vector which will hold our p-values. So initially, we haven't calculated any p-values. And then we just do the same thing. So we go through all of the columns uh, of the genotypes again. And we select the individuals which are 1. We select the individuals which are 2. And now we're just going to do a t-test um, between these two groups that we have defined. And so we're going to do a t-test of the individuals that are one on the first phenotype versus the individuals which have the genotype two on the first phenotype. And then hey, I'm directly going to select the p-value from the t-test. Um, and then hey, because this is QTL mapping, we want to show um, these these values as, as minus log 10 p-values. And, and now, because we have the code, I can also show you why we do the minus log 10 of the p-value. So let's just get the code and let's just show you guys the R window. Um, and so when I do this, we now see that at, at some points in the genome, there is some evidence. But here we see a massive peak and we see an even bigger peak here. So this means that because this is a, a minus log 10 p-value of 15, this means that the chance of this happening at random is 1 times 10 to the minus 15. Right? So the, the, there is 
and there's a high likelihood so the p-value here is 1 times 10 to the minus 15 that there is a real difference between the two genotype groups and here the likelihood is less but it's still like 1 times 10 to the minus 7 and so that means that there's only a chance of 1 in a million or 1 in 10 million at this point um, probably 1 in 10 million uh, that that this is not uh, a true difference in mean and that's how you do QTL mapping. So that's more or less everything that you need to know about QTL mapping. And in this case, we use t-tests, right? Um, but in the case that you have three groups, of course, you can use a standard t-test. Um, but then you have to use another statistical test, like a, using a linear model um, or um, using another like non-parametric test. Of course, like we're skipping over a lo lot of additional quality controls that, that we could have done and that we should have done. And like, look, if every, nor if every phenotype is normally distributed, um, and had, because we can only do a t-test when phenotypes are normally distributed. Um, but in this case, and it, it's just for you guys to practice a little bit, writing for loops, selecting individuals, and then from the other matrix, selecting these individuals, the, the phenotypes for these individuals, and then calculating a mean, and in the other case, you are doing a t-test. I hope that's clear. I hope that everyone was able to do the assignments, um, and that everyone was able to get some results. Um, so if you have any questions, then of course, let me know. Um, and of course, if, if you're working on the assignments um, and you get stuck halfway through, then um, definitely just drop me an email um, and then I can help you solve the, the questions that you have. All right, so if that is clear, then um, with this, um, we are going to switch back to the PowerPoint. All right, let me switch to the PowerPoint here as well. All right, so then we're going to talk a little bit about the history of PCR. And I want to keep this a little bit short. Normally I talk like half an hour about Kerry Mullis, um, of whom you see a photo here, um, because he's one of my favorite Nobel Prize winners. Um, so PCR was invented in 1983, so it's my year of birth. And PCR was invented by Kerry Bank, Banks Mullis, like you, the, I told you. And um, Kerry Banks Mutis is a very interesting person because um, he's a scientist. He is, he's considered the godfather of modern biology because of his invention of this PCR method. And the PCR method allows you to uh, amplify parts of the genome and um, in such quantities that you can do like Statist uh, that you can do testing, right? You can you can do corona testing using PCR. You can do um, testing for certain parts of, of the genome. So it is one of the most valuable techniques that we currently have in molecular biology. Um, and it, every molecular biology lab in the world is using this technique. Um, it is used in cloning, it's used in phylogenetics, it's used in gene analysis, it's used in genetic fingerprinting by the, by the police. Um, and um, you would think that because this is such an influential technique that, that uh, Herr Kerry Mullis actually made a lot of money out of it, um, but he did not really. Um, because at the moment, or had, he claims and that this is this is a true story. He claims that this technology, this new idea for doing PCR, was given to him by aliens, and um, that's interesting. And the aliens, when you, when asked how did they look like, well, they looked a little bit like um, colorful ferrets with all kinds of colors, um, and um, they told him that this would be kind of the best technology uh, to do or to look into genetics um, and and he did this and figured it out and he it's it's one of the most valuable techniques in the world um, Kerry Mullis has only written three papers in his whole life so if he has written two papers on PCR um, and one paper based on time travel so he won a Nobel Prize for his PCR papers. Not a lot of people are um, excited about his time travel paper, um, but if you are interested in reading um, a time travel paper or a paper about time travel from one of the, well, most leading um, 
molecular biologist, um, because kind of that's what he is by his invention of this methodology, um, then contact me and I can give you a copy of the paper. Um, if you want to read the paper and um, you go to science, I think it was published in, uh, then you have to pay like 20 bucks. Um, so if you want to have a copy, just, just contact me and I can give you a copy. He got a Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1993, so um, he did get some acknowledgement for, or he did get some financial acknowledgement for, of course, developing this method. Um, but the company that he was working for literally made billions and billions of dollars from his invention of PCR. Um, he got a bonus in uh, 1983 um, of $10,000. So that was his kind of company bonus for inventing this technology um, and the company itself made billions of dollars off his invention. He is also the author of a very interesting book which is uh, called Dancing Naked in the Mindfield. Um, I think you can find the book on, on Google Books. Um, but he's a very, very interesting person. Like he has its own Wikipedia page and uh, there's so much written about him. Um, and he's really one of my well, kind of heroes, I wouldn't say heroes, but hey, he's one of these interesting figures in molecular biology um, who kind of came out of nowhere, um, no prior publications, published this PCR technology, um, became more or less world famous through that, um, 10 years later getting a Nobel Prize, which is also very uncommon. Uh, normally it takes around 20 to 40 years before your, your publication or your invention is um, kind of vetted in the scientific community. Um, so to get a Nobel Prize uh, only 10 years after uh, inventing a methodology is um, really, really good. Um, you, don't, you don't see that very often. All right, so enough about the inventor of PCR. There's, there's many, many stories that you can tell about him. And um, if you're really interested, then we can talk afterwards about Kerry Banks Mewis. And you see that a lot actually, that, that people after winning a Nobel Prize kind of go, go a little bit crazy, but very, very interesting. All right, so PCR, what do you need? So if you want to do a PCR experiment, um, you need some template DNA. So template DNA is the DNA that you want to amplify. Um, you need water, um, a lot of water, or not so much a lot, but compared to the other ingredients you need a lot of water uh, you need to be able to do very precise thermal cycling so and this is not really a massive requirement um, but it is it, it, it nowadays if you want to do very small volume PCRs then you have to be very very precise in, in thermal terminal cycling that means that you have to have a machine uh, which can be um, 57 degrees exactly and then very quickly go from 57 degrees to 73 degrees Celsius or go to 90 degrees Celsius. And so you have to be able to very quickly change the temperature. Um, you need a heat stable polymerase. Um, nowadays, almost everyone uses TUC or um, have from the Thermus aquaticus bacteria, um, but there are many, many different polymerases out there. So the polymerase is a, is a protein um, which amplifies DNA. Um, you need um, nucleotides, so um, nucleotides are just the standard nucleotides that you could buy, so those are A, C, T and G um, for DNA. And you need oligo oligonucleotides, and these oligonucleotides are also called primers, so and that's what we're going to learn today, how to design these primers for this experiment. And if you're like me, then you actually need an unlucky student to do the PCR experiment for you. Um, I'm a bioinformatician, so I don't work in a lab, um, so that's why we have master and bachelor and PhD students running around um, doing these PCR experiments in the lab. Um, so my job as a bioinformatician, when it comes to PCR is only this little part is designing the oligonucleotides based on the template DNA. All right, so in PCR we have three steps and these three steps occur at different temperatures, right? So we need very precise thermal cycling. And so um, when we start off, we have the template DNA um, and we have this template DNA in solution. So it's just a double stranded DNA, which you, for example, extracted from a nucleus. Um, but what happens when you start heating up the water with this template DNA in there, then at 90 degrees Celsius, uh, the the two strands of DNA will kind of go um, and, and loosen up, right? So they will be um, 
single stranded. Yeah, by raising the temperature, uh, you raise the kind of energy inside of the water slash uh, mic uh, the water um, plus the uh, DNA mixture, um, and by heating it up to around 90 degrees Celsius, um, you will have um, single stranded DNA. Um, and this is because the polymerase needs to, uh, uh, th this is because we need to do stuff with the DNA. So when the DNA is double stranded, it's, it's more or less inaccessible. Things can't really bind to the DNA. But by, by, um, by making the temperature 90 degrees, um, DNA becomes single stranded. All right, so the next step is then to anneal your primers to the DNA, and this happens at around 54 degrees Celsius. Um, so hey, what you do is you, you, you have your mixture of your water, your nucleotides, your primers, and your template DNA. Um, you heat it up to 90 degrees Celsius. Um, you keep it at 90 degrees Celsius for around 30 seconds, and then 30 seconds uh, after 30 seconds, you quickly reduce the temperature to 54 degrees Celsius. And what now, what starts happening is that the DNA DNA starts rebinding, um, but because primers are much much smaller than the template DNA, the kind of the primers will bind um, very quickly um, before the template DNA can more or less close again. Um, so here we see little primers, and so these primers will just hybridize to the DNA at their complementary sequence. And of course, they can only hybridize to complementary sequences. Then the next step is the elongation step in PCR. So in the next step we raise the temperature to around 72 degrees Celsius and at 72 degrees Celsius what will happen is the polymer polymerase will bind the double-stranded DNA and it will start extending the double-stranded DNA in the 3' prime direction. Um, yeah, so here we see that there is a primer bound here at the 3' prime end of the first strand of DNA and the polymerase will just start extending uh, the DNA uh, unt un until the time is up. So a normal polymerase can copy around a, a thousand base pairs every minute. Um, slightly more, it might be like a thousand five hundred, might be two thousand depending on the polymerase, um, but hey, it will just start copying the DNA and of course this will use up the, um, the nucleotides that we put into the mixture. So what happens um, is that you get an exponential amplification of the target DNA more or less. So here we have the template DNA where we have our piece of interest, right? So we designed primers to amplify this piece. So we have two primers, one forward and one reverse, which are an exact match to the kind of flanking regions of the DNA that we want to uh, that we want to uh, amplify. And then what starts happening in, in the first cycle, um, here we create two copies of this DNA, and then in the second cycle, each one of these copies is multiplied again. Yeah, so in the first round or in the first cycle or after the first cycle you have two copies of the DNA because you start with one and this is amplified. So you have the original one and the, and the new one. Um, and then in the second round um, these two copies of the DNA will be copied again. Um, so you will have four copies going to eight copies to 16 copies. And if you do 35 cycles then you end up with around 34 billion copies of your target DNA. Um, so this, this allows you to get large, large quantities of DNA um, which are matching the, or which are between the primer sequence that you selected. Of course this is more or less a simplification. What really happens is slightly different. What really happens is, is that of course in the first cycle you don't really get any products that you are interested in. Yeah, because when we look at it in detail we see here that we have the DNA of interest so we go 5 prime 3 prime and so we open up the DNA we bind the primer and in the first round it will be amplified but the, it will not be it will not stop at the other primer it will just continue um, amplifying. And it's the same for the other one. Here. So you have a forward prime, or you have a reverse primer binding here, so going back, and you have a forward primer binding here, going forward. Um, but in the end, hey, you will have two long pieces of DNA, which are from your original template, uh, from your original template, and you have two pieces of DNA which are of more or less unknown length, um, but they will start at the position where the primer is. So you will have one piece of DNA which is relatively uh, long going to the left side and you have another piece of DNA which goes to the right side. 
In the second cycle we also don't get any product yet um, because have now when we open up these two pieces of DNA we will have like a long uh, we will have the template DNA that will always still be there. Uh, we get an amplification very similar to the previous amplification so a primer a reverse primer will bind the polymerase will extend the DNR uh, will extend the uh, the primer um, and here what what happens is is that we have this piece of template right so we have the the, the piece that was here and now there will be an amplification of the forward primer so this is where we more or less get a single stranded piece of DNA um, which is kind of matching the length that we are interested in and this the same thing happens in the in the other branch of the tree so only in the third cycle will we have our first kind of real um, um, uh, amplification and because only when you start amplifying this little piece of DNA so this will open up and this will then be amplified but because it already ended at the correct position this piece of DNA is now of the length that we expect it to be um, so I hope this is clear um, so it takes two cycles in PCR to warm up um, to kind of get the template down right because we first cut the template at the uh, at the five prime and and then we cut the template at uh, we could first cut the template at the three prime end then at the five prime end and then in the third cycle we get our first piece of DNA which is of the correct length and is double stranded and of course these will be and these will open up again and then in the th in the fourth cycle you will actually directly jump to eight uh, copies so hey, it's not like we saw before that you get 2, 4, 8, 16. No, hey, because of the way that PCR works, you will go from 0 to 0 to having two copies which are valid and then directly go to eight copies which are valid because hey, you have your, your, your copies from the round before which are still in the, uh, in the PCR reaction. All right, I hope that is clear. So if someone asks you how to calculate um, the yield from from PCR, um, then you should be able to do that. Hey, it is it is of course two, four, eight, sixteen, and so you end up with around thirty-four billion copy after thirty-five cycles. But you have to remember that there are more or less two cycles needed to kind of warm up. So only after thirty-seven cycles are you at uh, thirty-four billion copies. So the, the formula is not two to the power of x, but it's actually two to the power of x plus two. All right, so let's talk about what is a good primer. Um, so a good primer is unique. And I will be saying this a lot because um, it is the thing that is most difficult to achieve. Um, and had the first sentence is lack of a secondary priming site. And so the primer is not allowed to bind to multiple locations in the genome. It is only allowed to bind to a single location in the genome. Otherwise, your primer is not specific enough. So the primer needs to have a melting temperature. So the melting temperature is the temperature at which the DNA opens because primers, when you buy them, you get them in double-stranded format or you get them double-stranded. So a primer needs to go from double-stranded to single-stranded much earlier than the genomic DNA. Um, and the primer needs to kind of open up, so it needs to be... Um, and needs to have like a, a go from double stranded to single stranded somewhere between 52 and 65 degrees Celsius. And this is of course because it has to attach to the DNA at the low temperature. So at the low temperature, which we saw here, so at the 54 degree mark, it has to be single stranded the primer, otherwise it won't bind. Of course, it, it also the primer is also at the 90 degrees, so hey, it will also have the same kind of temperature drop. Uh, but in general, if you want to have a very successful PCR, you want to have your melting temperature of the primer uh, to be between 52 and 65 degrees Celsius. The primer has to have any absence of dimerization capability. We will get back to that, but it means that a primer is not allowed to bind to itself or bind to any of the other primers um, in the uh, in 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 the in the reaction. Right? It, we could do a reaction with five primers or ten primers, and these are not allowed to kind of stick together. Um, so hey, when you design a forward primer and a reverse primer, you always have to make sure that the sequences of them are not in such a way that they can bind together. Um, you always want to make sure that there cannot be any significant hairpin formation and a hairpin formation is when a primer folds back on itself. Yeah, because a normal 
rev uh, revolution of DNA, if you look at a DNA helix, um, that's around four base pairs. So every four base pairs, uh, the DNA revolves in, in a helical structure um, and but that means that when you have like a, a primer which is 20 base pairs long it can actually fold back on itself um, so you want to make sure that inside of the primer there is not a sequence which is complementary to a sequence within the primer itself. And most importantly is you want to have low specific binding at the three prime end um, and so that means that you want to have a lower GC content at the three prime end of your primer and this is because polymerases need to have um, or, or for a polymerase to work properly it, it cannot the, the primer cannot be bound too tightly to the DNA at the three prime end um, and if we look here and then at the three prime end is where the extension starts right so at the three prime end and this three prime end needs to be a little bit loose so it, it, it if it sticks too tightly to the template DNA then the polymerase will bind but it's not able to, to kind of start um, um, amplifying uh, the DNA so you want to have a lower um, uh, lower binding so you want to have more A's and T's than GC's at this this three prime end of the primer. All right so let's go through all of these uh, in more detail so lack of a primary uh, secondary priming side means that the primer needs to be unique and the, the, the rule is there shall only be one and only one target site in the template DNA where the primer binds and so the primer sequence shall be a unique in the template um, and then this uniqueness of course does not only hold for your template DNA that you are amplifying right if we are working in the lab here we work on mice we work on chicken we work on on goats and on cows and so these are all possible sources of contamination and of course when we do a PCR amplification of mouse DNA then of course we want to make sure that our primer is not able to bind to human because when I'm doing the pipetting, right, so when I'm making the master mix, um, I don't want any of my DNA to be in the cup, but you can't really prevent like little flakes of your skin falling into the, the cups that you are using. Um, so if you are, if you are amplifying mouse DNA, you also want to make sure that the primer that you are using is unique to mouse and does not occur in a human DNA strand because of the fact that there's always little pieces of skin floating around which can end up in your reaction mixture um, and had, by making sure that your primer cannot bind to humans um, you kind of exclude humans as a, as a possible source of contamination and so in our lab we always check our primers against human against mouse uh, and against uh, cattle um, because those are the three main species that we are working with and we want to exclude that when we are doing a reaction on mice and that some contamination from humans or from cattle comes in um, and this is very easy to do because you can just when you have designed your primer um, you can just do a blast search against the corresponding genomes so in many cases hey, if you're working on plants then you design a primer which is unique to your plant you take the primer and you just blast it against the human database to make sure that your primer cannot bind to humans all right then the link then the length of the primer is very um, important in this sense because the length of the primer has an effect on its uniqueness the longer the primer um, the more chance that it is unique and generally we end up having primers which are around 20 to 25 base pairs and this is because this is the amount of base pairs that you need for a primer to be unique in the target DNA but also not being able to bind to DNA for example from from humans yeah. so the longer the primer the more chance that it is a unique primer that there's only one binding site however with extending the primer um, uh, you you have the annealing temperature go up yeah. and that's kind of the um, interplay here because normally you would say well um, we can make a primer which is 80 base pairs long and that will guarantee the uniqueness but of course then you're breaking the uh, TM the, the melting temperature part because the melting temperature part needs to be between 52 and like 60 degrees Celsius and so we, we can't just make primers infinitely long to make them unique 
So it's always kind of a balance between the two. Um, so generally speaking, the length of a primer has to be at least 15 base pairs to be unique. And um, we in our lab usually pick primers which are between 17 and 28 base pairs long. Um, and that is because when you are at 28 base pairs, and then you're really pushing the, the annealing and the melting temperature towards what, what is maximum um, f or what is, what is maximally allowed for the, uh, for the reaction that you're doing. All right, so the base composition of the primer itself, so if you look at the base pairs like the ACTs and Gs, um, it affects the hybridization specificity and the annealing temperature. An AT pair only has two um, hydrogen bridges, so they, they have two bindings to each other, while a CG pair has three bindings. So in av or, or, or as a rule of thumb, you can say that when you have an AT binding in DNA, then uh, a CG binding, uh, compared to a CG binding, the CG binding binds 50% more tightly because there's just an, a, a third hydrogen bridge that keeps them together. And so you have two hydrogen bridges in an AT pair and in a GC pair you have three hydrogen bridges. So hey, you want to um, kind of balance that because hey, if your primer just contains a large amount of C's and G's, it will bind very strongly to the template DNA. And of course, this will also up the, um, the uh, melting temperature because you need more energy to have a, a, a CG rich primer go from being double stranded to being single stranded. Yeah, so usually the average CG content should be around 50 to 60 percent and had that, that will give us the right melting and annealing temperature. However, melting temperature and hybridization can be affected by other factors, um, but had the CG content is not fixed. If you are dealing with, for example, bacteria, some bacteria have very high CG content. So the template DNA, if the template DNA is like 80 percent CG, then of course you, you have to design a primer which is complementary to that. So your primer ends up having an 80% CG content as well. But the base composition, it's something that you can kind of play with because you can move your primer from left to right, um, but it is allowed to change. Um, but on average, especially when you're dealing with like plants or humans or mice or cattle, um, you want to have it at around 50 to 60%, which is very similar to the normal CG content of a, of a human or a mouse or a plant genome. But of course, this just changes. All right, so the melting temperature is the temperature at which half of the DNA strands are single stranded and half of them are double stranded, right? So hey, if you heat up um, DNA in water, um, then at 20 degrees Celsius, all of the DNA will be double stranded. Hey, but when you start raising the temperature, then hey, the DNA starts more or less disassociating from each other. And at a certain point, half of the DNA is double stranded, half of the DNA is single stranded, and that is called the melting temperature. So the, the melting temperature is characteristic of the DNA composition, like I said, higher GC content has a higher melting temperature because of more hydrogen bonds needing to be broken. So you can calculate the TM relatively easy when you have very short pieces of DNA. And so when your DNA is, uh, the, the, the primer that you are designing is, is less than 13 base pair, um, you can use this formula to calculate the melting temperature. So it is the number of A's plus the number of T's times 2 plus the number of G's plus the number of C's. Uh, uh, yeah, so the number of G's plus the number of C's times 4. So here it's not 2 to 3, um, but this gets a times 4. Um, and this is the temperature at which um, your DNA binds. Yeah, so if we have uh, a piece of DNA, which is A, A, uh, T, T, so four A's and T's, um, and it has four C's and G's, yeah, then it is 4 times 2 is 8, 4 times 4 is 16, so it's 8 plus 16. Um, so yeah, that's 24 degrees Celsius when half of the DNA strands are, but that's of course only when they are shorter than 13 base pairs. When they are longer than 13 base pairs, you have to use the more complex formula. So the more complex formula is here is um, 64.9 um, plus 41 times, and then you divide the number of G's and C's minus 16.4 divided by the sum of base pairs that you have. And the nice thing about this formula is if you would plot it in R, right, if you would go from having like, um, um, go from like very low numbers, so very low amounts of C's and G's to very high amount of C's and G's and A's and T's, eh, you end up at this 90 degrees Celsius range eh, because you would you will have 
uh, 64.9 plus 41 times some number divided by the total number. Yeah, so if, if this part here reaches like 100 million, right, kind of goes to infinity, then this thing goes to half of infinity. So it's like one divided by two. So and that would mean that you end up with 64.9 plus um, or uh, 64.9 plus around uh, 20, um, which is around 80, 85 degrees Celsius. So genomic DNA, hey, you can calculate it in TM of genomic DNA as well, but that will end, always end up being around like 84 to 90 degrees Celsius, depending on the CG content. Um, but yeah, when when we will, um, hey, you, there's there's form or there's calculators online which allow you to to automatically calculate it but hey you can calculate easily by hand uh, what the melting temperature of your DNA will be. So the annealing temperature, the, the annealing temperature is the temperature at which the primers bind to the template DNA is calculated from the TM and that's just the melting temperature minus four degrees Celsius and this is just a rule of thumb uh, that hey, if you calculate the TM so the melting temperature then your annealing temperature that you want to use so the temperature at which you want to kind of do the second step of the PCR reaction is just the melting temperature minus four degrees Celsius. All right, so secondary structures are things that we want to avoid. So if a primer can anneal to themselves or anneal to each other, um, rather than anneal to the template, the PCR efficiency will decrease dramatically. Yeah, so for example, you can have hairpin structures in which a primer folds back on itself, um, and we can have self-dimerization. So here we have two times the same primer, um, but by swapping the primer from going from three prime to, to the other way around, you see that now the primer is able to bind to itself and because it binds binds to itself it will preferentially bind to itself because of course there's a lot of primer in the reaction but there's only very few template DNA so there's a very big chance that if things are self complementary then self dimers will form and this will reduce your PCR efficiency very very dramatically. Since primers always come in pairs, because we have to have a primer which specifies from from we want from copy to copy, right? So we have a, a forward one and a reverse one. Uh, we also need to make sure that primers cannot bind to each other. So if we use a forward primer, then of course it's not allowed to have a similar sequence or a complementary sequence in the reverse primer. Um, so sometimes these two or the, the secondary structures are harmless when the annealing temperature does not allow them to take place. And for example, some dimers of hairpins form at 30 degrees Celsius, um, but if you are doing PCR, then you never get below 60 degrees Celsius. And so there's a, 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 some of these are more harmful than others. And when you design primers using a computer, using computer software, and then the computer software will also give you an overview of hey, this hairpin might happen uh, at a temperature of um, 53 degrees Celsius. So then you say, well, in my PCR reaction, I'm no, never going to be at 53 degrees Celsius. So this is not an issue. However, um, make sure that when you when you do primer design that you do check the primers for secondary structures like hairpins, um, self dimerization or dimerization with one of the other primers in the um, in the reaction. All right, so I've been talking now for 52 minutes. I will stop the recording and we will do the first break and um, I will be back at um, like 310 and then we will continue with the rest of the lecture. So let me stop.